questions, uh, Zainab. So just let me start by a quick introduction of myself. Um, first of all, I'm an EWAP member like you and uh, or, you know, people maybe to be EWAP members. So um, I joined about a year ago. Um, apart from that, I'm a past executive, a CFO and a CEO, uh, and currently a board member, independent board member, as well as an IFC nominee board director on a number of boards. As of today, officially, I joined a bank on a board, so I'm quite excited. As per regulation, I had to go to the court and swear that I would, you know, by, by the regulation. So that's my new role, very <laughs> new. Thank you, Chala. Um, and uh, for about more than a year, I've been working uh, along with, let's say, David on the DCRO, Directors and Chief Risk Officers Institute, and discovering more and more the world of risk and how it can turn into a value creating actually uh, aspect uh, in the boardroom. So today uh, I'm welcoming our guest uh, as well as my conversation partner, David Kenning. Mm. David is the president and CEO of the DCRO Institute. He's an award uh, winning author of the governance reimagined uh, organizational design risk and value creation, as well as the board members guide to risk. During his executive career, David has created corporate risk management programs uh, at three different companies, and he has managed complex financial portfolios uh, in uh, large amounts of uh, I mean, quite billion dollars in size. He serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Risk Management in Financial Institutions, and he's the founder of the Directors and Chief Risk Officers Group, as well as the DCRO Institute and a co-founder of the Professional Risk Managers International Association. So he brings skills as a qualified risk director and internationally recognized risk governance expert. So he is really dedicated towards the mission of guiding companies through uh, risk-taking, innovation, and governance. So pleasure to have you, David, with us nice today. To Nice um, to see you, Rishim. Very glad to be I, here. I uh, miss out on any important thing, but we'll cover that in the conversation, I guess. Yeah. So I think let me start by asking, and this is going to be a two-way round, so I'm going to post some questions to David, and uh, I, I hope he's going to pose not so difficult questions back to me. <laughs> so let's start. So David, tell us about when, why, and how you decided to form the DCRO, the Directors and Chief Risk Officers Group, uh, and how was the journey? Just take us through a little bit the why maybe to start and the how. Yeah, yeah I, will, I will do my best to give the elevator speech, but what I've said to some people is that this elevator tends to go up and down a few times, so I will try to shorten the ride. Um, but first off, I want to say thank you for inviting me to be here. Yashim, you and I met face to face last summer yep. and we had the chance to talk about these things together and and since then I've really enjoyed getting to know you and seeing your work and I don't think that at that time you knew of the conversations I was having with Ewab on the side about trying to do some things together so it was a very happy uh very happy instance when we discovered that connecting point so I'm glad to be here uh, I love groups like this I'm very happy that we can we can try and share some ideas and get into conversation. Hopefully we find some ways to work together. So getting to your question, part of it is in the background that you described. So in my the first half of my career, I was an active risk manager. Um, I was leading risk management programs at a few different companies. And I was also a volunteer for a professional association of risk managers that <clears throat> had a governance scandal. And it was one of those things like most governance scandals that gets discovered through a small issue that someone is uncomfortable with and you dig and you dig and you find there's a much, much bigger issue there. And what happened in that case was that we were, were all volunteers for this group. I mean, it was a global group. Um, I ran chapters for them in Chicago and Minneapolis and the States for the Midwest region. We tried our best to fix that governance issue. And we weren't able to. And so a number of us decided to launch a program or launch this association called Premia, which is the Professional Risk Managers International Association. It was a group that was never supposed to be. 
<clears throat> but what happened was people around the world noticed that this was something they wanted to be a part of. It was a collaboration. It was very focused on helping um, advance the risk profession as a nonprofit. And I wound up being pulled away from my risk role. When I, when I told the company I was asked to run this organization, I told them it would probably take about eight months to get it in place and, and get things started. And it wound up taking six or seven years. And so it was actually a wonderful experience because I was meeting with people all over the world. But about 2007, I felt that I could finally hand this over to the people we'd put in place. And the first thing I did after I was done with that was to do a program with a guy named Michael Keener. Michael is on the faculty at Columbia Business School and also a board member of a, um, a publicly traded company in the States. And we asked the very simple question, do boards understand risk? This is 2007. You know what came after that in the global financial crisis. So you know the answer we got was no. So when we got that answer, <clears throat> I decided to launch this group, and literally it was a group on LinkedIn called the Directors and Chief Risk Officers Group. So DCR, DCRO, Directors and Chief Risk Officers. And our goal was to try and connect board members with their risk infrastructure so that they could each understand each other better. Back when we launched this, there were maybe two or 300 chief risk officers in the world. So it was still a fairly new profession, mostly in finance and energy. But our efforts were to collaborate, meet, share best practices, help each other through the financial crisis. We issued guiding principles documents, and then we defined something called a qualified risk director to serve on boards. And a qualified risk director is somebody who's like a qualified financial expert on an audit committee, but has this special understanding of risk. So the elevator hopefully now is going to its last ride on the, on the building. When we reached the financial, or excuse me, when we reached the pandemic, we had moved from a state where no one was really talking about boards and risk to a place where everyone was talking about boards and risk. And so I reached out to the group members and said, is there any need for us anymore? Is there any reason we do this? Because look, the world's talking about boards and risk. And the answer that came back was we needed to put some formal education together to help people understand risk in a very different way, a very a way tied to what boards try to do, what organizations try to do, very goal-based, outcome-based understanding of risk. We needed to make sure that risk wasn't co-opted by people who wanted to sell fear, because it's really easy in a crisis for people to come out of the walls to be risk experts and sell people on everything that can go wrong. And that's not just during the pandemic, that's still the case today. And the third thing was they said, we need to formalize this notion of a qualified risk director. So how do we make that something that we can actually approve people to have that designation? So that's where the DCRO Institute was born. And that's now just two, two years and a month ago, roughly. We started with our first program called the Board Members Course on Risk. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? And so it's a credential that people get. I think that's how you and I first connected. And today, um, you know, just two years after we started, we have a whole, I mean, just a whole library of programs available to help develop people who are serving on boards. We have graduates or programs serving on boards in more than 35 countries. Um, we mentioned IFC. We had a really nice partnership with the IFC last summer that brought a number of their nominee directors into our programs. We have partnerships with all sorts of associations around the world. And it feels like we've got a nice momentum building in service of this idea that organizations exist to take risk to fulfill their mission. So how do we help? We're peer collaboration. We're board members, C-suite executives, all teaching each other. And one of the great things for me is that we already have people enrolled in our, 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 our learning platform from over 95 countries. And that tells me that we're getting this global reach that we're trying to establish by bringing in ideas from all around the world and sharing best practices all around the world. So again, I'm sorry that elevator ride gets a little bit long, yep. but, but you have to understand that what, what brought us here was a need and that need still exists. And that's what we're trying to help address. Excellent. And actually I'm gonna give the group a kind of a <laughs> tip into how you do the job because when I uh -oh. met you, yeah, well, and it's networking. It's what EWOP mm -hmm. is also, you know, it's using the huge power of connecting 
helping people who have a common objective or need, as you said. And uh, uh, that's a little bit similar to EWAP in my, uh, the way I see it. I mean, we are also a network. And as Edwidge says, we is, uh, always says, I mean, network is connection and doing work. So you bring us together to do work towards that mission. And indeed, I'm amazed by how many people you speak to in a day. I mean, you speak to people from Asia, US, Europe. So you're all over connecting people around this need. Is that... A kind of a also hobby for you or work? How do you see it personally? It's what I love. It's really what I love about this. Um, you know, in the typical day, as you said, I'm speaking to people on two or three continents. Um, everyone has an interesting story. Everyone has a different perspective that they're bringing to this conversation. I try to find how to bring that voice into what we're doing, either through connecting with other people or thinking about someone who can bring in a case study interview for us or lead a session for us or be a faculty member for us. Um, so it is, you know, it's the life of what we do. We are a collaboration. I, I keep saying that to people. We are a nonprofit collaboration. We're not a business trying to sell products. We are a bunch of people saying, how do we make this better? How do we share with each other whatever industry we're in, whatever geography we're in, whatever stage we're at in terms of our board ascendancy? Um, I find that I learn something every single day. And, and so I, I truly love that. I, I just, I, you know, we, we, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about the importance of diversity in, in organizations succeeding. Um, but it's the diversity of all of these conversations I have, which just, I, I, I try to explain to my kids how much I love this. Um, it's never felt, it never feels like work because of that. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to give an example into the way after I started working uh, together along with you yeah. on a little bit of the mission, I, I started to feel something different in the boards that I serve. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that was the way I look at it, the, the way I looked at risk, which became very different than how I saw it before. I, I was in the early parts of my career working in finance. So uh, I did have a, a in, and in Turkey, so which meant we had a lot of financial crisis, a lot of things that we were exposed to risk many in many aspects. But then after getting to understand the work that is done under DCRO, I, I started really to have a new lens and maybe there'll be some ways to describe it uh, along yeah. the way. Well, and, and I'm glad for that because, you know, getting back to that point of why the Institute was formed was because we didn't want risk to be co-opted by people who were selling fear. And I think still um, to this day, if you ask someone to define the word risk, their mind is going to go towards things that go wrong. And if you ask someone to define their role in the board, it's about helping the organization achieve goals. Those are on the other side of each other. So what we're trying to do is to say, yes, you have to think about things that can go wrong, but rather than focus on that as the risk conversation, the question is, how well do we understand the risks we need to take to achieve those goals? That's the fundamental difference in how we approach this. You have to be focused on how you'll respond to what you didn't expect, but you need to turn risk into an input. So we think of human capital, we think of physical capital, technological capital, intellectual capital, human capital, all these things that we put into our models or our minds for planning how to achieve our goals. And then for some reason, we put risk in another place. And we say, oh, okay, well, let's talk about all those things that can go wrong. Get, get that person in here who knows what can go wrong. As opposed to saying, the market, whoever it is, all of these people who are part of our organization, they give us the capacity to pursue our goals. What drives that? What drives their willingness to give us that capacity? That's what a risk is. And risk is the ability to take risk, the ability to pursue these things. And so a healthy board discussion, and, and maybe we'll talk about this later too, a healthy board discussion around risk is one that says, do we understand the cost of risk, the price of risk? How are we charging for it? How is it that we're incorporating that in our strategic decisions? And, you know, Yashim, I would love, because you and I have talked a little bit about this too, 
I would love to hear from you when you think about this now in the new way. You're on a couple of different types of boards, different organizations. So for them, their strategic goals are different. The regulations they face are different. The kinds of expectations they have are different. I'd love to hear from you, you know, how, how does this change depending on what board you're on? When you say you take this new lens in, what's the, yeah. you know, what's, what's, the, what's the way in which you implement it? Thank you. Um, in fact, yes, uh, the, the way companies look at risk and the way they uh, place it into their governance is of course different uh, depending on the maturity of the co uh, company, depending on their uh, culture, definitely depending on their leadership. And actually <clears throat> there's a question that I'm gonna later ask you, whose job is it? In fact, yeah. who has to lead the, the topic of risk? And based on my experience, this is typically given, uh, I'll pick a few examples, to a committee which is called the early detection of risk. So first I was really kind of surprised by the name of the committee. So it's like early detection of risk so that we catch it and we can kind of like get rid of it before it gets too big. Actually, there's a nice thing about early detection which is being proactive. So you actually uh, see the risk or let's call it the uncertainty, the, the thing that can go uh, have a, you know, it can go the good way or the bad way. So it's about uncertainty, actually. It, it's not necessarily bad, but it's, mm -hmm. it can, it has a uncertainty element. So this early detection I found was useful mm -hmm. from a proactive standpoint, but it was indeed really limiting to a too narrow jargon, too narrow mm -hmm. kind of library. And Actually, I was speaking and had a nose on a board diploma program. So I asked people, what, how would you define risk in terms of if, if you were to give a definition? Uh, how would you act on that risk? And, and just give me some categories of risk. So what does uh, risk categories? And obviously the first things that come are financial risk, operational risk, and maybe climate, cyber, geopolitical. Of course, those are all our top of mind, but there are mm -hmm. also other risks that we don't talk about, like some of the intangible, some of reputation risk. Of course, ESG is there, but are mm -hmm. we talking enough about technology, not in the technical sense, but also in the strategic sense? So back to the question, the thing that I started having a new lens was expanding the existing definitions of risk that existed in the boardroom, in the committees specifically, and trying to bring that discussion from the committees to the boardroom. Because what was happening was that the committee would handle the risk discussion, get it right. over with, and then don't carry it back to the boardroom. Right, right. Stop right. there, maybe you have a question. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, I think that's, that's not uncommon, right? You think it's been dealt with by the committee. Can I go back to this um, early detection of risk committee? Um, because I've, I've not heard something named that before, but I think I know something similar. Is that a board committee or is that an executive committee? It's a board committee. Um, so, it is, uh, maybe that's the, uh, maybe in Turkey, it can be the regulation because it, it's the specifically um, uh, a committee for the uh, publicly traded companies that the way they report it in the governance uh, to the um, uh, market, stock market. So, and, and to comment on that, I am a huge advocate of something called a problem response team or people have emerging risk teams. They're, they're things that, that are similar to that, but they're at the executive level. And I'll, I'll tell you a couple, I'll give you the one example of one that I was part of that worked really, really well, was that we had been empowered by the board and the C-suite to take any decision, any decision that we thought was in the best interests of the company. Mm -hmm. So we had a group that was heads of risk, um, uh, IT, you know, uh, general counsel, those kinds of people who, who really you would want involved in these decisions. And we had the power to bring anybody in that we needed to at any time. Wow. 
So if someone said to us, this event is happening or something might occur, we could convene immediately and make a decision without worrying that we were going to be second guessed. And I can tell you on a number of occasions where that committee saved the organization quite a bit of money. Now, if you move that up to the board level, you've lost the ability to respond quickly. And so I'm really interested to hear that it's a board level committee. Um, the other thing to this is that, let me, let me talk about risk in the context of the future. Um, you may hear me or you may have heard me use this expression, Nishim, about reshaping the future. Yes. That's the fundamental philosophy I bring to risk. So if you just walk outside and you haven't made any plans, outside may be somewhat random. But what you can do is to make decisions, get information, prepare yourself so that it's more likely when you go outside, you enjoy the experience and less likely that something happens like you get rained on in a brand new suit. So you can extend that out to everything a business does. What helps us succeed? Let's invest in the things that make it more likely that risk is something that we realize on the upside. Yep. So the deviation from our expectations is that it's better than we ever expected. Then we also want to look at how we respond to surprises. And that's this problem response team, or, or in your case with the board level, uh, early detection of risk committee. And the idea there is that you truncate the impact of things that could go wrong. But it's just one part of the whole view of risk. And if the whole view of risk is, how do we get in the way of things that might hurt us? We've missed all of that stuff on the upside. So the focus on the downside, I think, is about 20% of the value that understanding risk better brings to an organization. It's much better for us to understand what drives our success and what is it that might interfere with the drivers of those success or what we can do to enhance the drivers of those success in this empowerment idea. That's where we get these results that go well beyond our expectations. Much like you talk about the network of EWOB, the network we've got in the DCRO Institute, anybody who's been part of other networks knows that the network effect of something positive is usually substantially better than anything anyone had thought of at the start. So I, I hope that makes some sense, but I am, I am kind of surprised to hear that those committees are at the board level. That's, to, in my mind, not fast enough, not able to, not able to respond fast enough. I guess you're totally right. And that shows how the limited view of looking at risk. It's really yeah. to capture those problem areas and solve them before they get too big. Now, coming to the positive areas, yeah. obviously, like, when we had the COVID pandemic, of course, uh, I have seen that some of the companies, and I was at the executive level at that time, we did start asking the question, how can we turn this into competitive advantage? How can we move faster, be more resilient, be more you know, agile? So I think the upside starts by asking, having the right dialogues at the right level, whether it's executive level or the board level of mm -hmm the right conversations, the right committees, uh, empowered teams who have the right dialogues, who talk about scenario planning, saying that, mm -hmm. okay, here are the things that can happen. Mm -hmm. This is what we don't know. So let's have a good conversation as to how can we find the upside? So what can we turn from a potential risk into an opportunity or have the lenses of looking into the future, as you say, the reframing, and saying that we have a strategic opportunity here and let's look at ways we can leverage that. So it's really about, we call it under the risk umbrella, but it's really about thinking strategically, having the right conversations and empowering teams, which is very wide. And it's not necessarily something that people think of when they hear the word risky. Yeah, and, and I think pandemic is in, in some cases a really good example of, of different ways of thinking about this stuff. So there are plenty of companies out there who had prepared for pandemics. I mean, it wasn't a surprise that there was a pandemic. The, a global pandemic was actually overdue based on history of pandemics. So I think of a grocery chain in, in Texas called HEB. They are sort of a textbook case for being ready for things. 
And what they had done in advance was not just to say, well, here's our resiliency plan. Here's, here's the book, open the book and it'll tell you what to do. They understood why people shopped at their stores. They understood why people worked for them. They understood why investors gave them capital. They understood all of that stuff ahead of time. So that even if you have a playbook in front of you for a pandemic, and that's not the event that happens, you already have in your mind all of these reasons that people engage with you. And when you understand why people engage with you and provide you with all these different forms of capital, you build trust with those people. And when you recognize that risk and, and, and dealing with risk is about enhancing trust and at a minimum maintaining trust, yeah. then the discussion about being ready is an easy one because you say, all right, how are we going to handle anything that might damage trust people have in us as capital providers in all of their different forms? So in the pandemic, when boards were um, saying, what do we do now? Well, our people can't come into work. What do we do now? Our people are worried. What do we do now? Our customers don't know if we can deliver. What do we do now? Those are conversations that all happen in advance. Exactly. And so it's not a matter of saying, what do we do now? It's saying, who's doing what we planned? Yeah. And so I think there's a big, there's a big um, argument in favor of focusing on what gives you the capital to pursue your goals. And that's taking the discussion out of you. So for example, Yushin, let's say you and I were in a boardroom and we were both talking about the quote, risk appetite of the company. Each of us is going to be expressing our own personal belief. When the real conversation is, what is it that everybody provides us with capital values? That's the risk appetite I care most about. Yeah. And that's how you, that's how you, you can respond. <laughs> so, you know, let's maybe think about this with us. You're in your board roles again. You look at everything that's out there right now, whether, you know, I think you'd mentioned the geopolitics, technology. I mean, Chat GPT is one of these things that has just blown people away, but people I know who know what's coming say that's just minor compared to what you're going to see in the next year. All of these things that are in motion. So uh, the expression is what? Uh, volatile, uncertain. Yeah. Um, it's VUCA, whatever the VUCA stands yeah. for. Yes, complex, the ambiguity. Complex yeah. and ambiguous. A ambiguous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so what do you do in a boardroom to talk about? looking at something that is so difficult to see forward on, yeah. so many parts interacting with each other. I mean, the, the first thing is to make room for those conversations. I mean, really mm -hmm. it's difficult when you're living through short-term pressures. I mean, like in Turkey, we have elections upcoming. I mean, it occupies your full mind. So the yep. number one thing is to make space for the discussion, whether it's mm -hmm. time, you know, an empty, uh, you know, piece of uh, empty screen or whatever. I mean, and the right audience. I mean, the audience and the listening. So definitely it has to be moderated. It has to be the right questions need to be posed and it has to be, uh, you know, in the culture. I think it starts with building the culture of having the right conversations. Uh, the other thing is, I mean, we talked about scenario planning. I mean, we have to talk scenarios and we have to, you know, yeah. say what if, what if. And it starts by like, uh, I'll give an example. One of the companies I advised, uh, and they were a scale up, but the, the really successful one. They had a team called customer listening. So they oh, had this team called customer listening team, and they would just gather their whole job was to listen to customers and think of all the valuable insights they gather and obviously they had things to act upon they had things to you know prepare for listen to and they were just listening right I mean one of the difficult things we know about feedback is we all get defensive like we hear <laughs> it happens in the boardroom I mean the management is sharing let's say something they present their financials and then they have many reasons why things have gone the way it has, but are we really listening, hearing, and doing something about what we hear? You know, so I think I'll say well, that. Well, and let me, 
let me let me add something to you just said because a conversation I had yesterday, again, one of those really interesting conversations that I'm, I'm fortunate to have. We were talking a little bit about this, particular being the lone voice at the board. And this isn't necessarily gender, um, uh, limited to gender, but I do hear it from more women who are the first or only board member that there is a, a sense or a feeling that they begin as a lone voice, you know, whether true or not, feeling like they represent their gender. On top of that, suppose that you're someone who sees something strategic that the board should talk about. It could be something that's going wrong or it could be an opportunity. How do you make your voice credible? You know, we talked a little bit about this last week in our, in our, uh, yeah. the, the salon we had. How do you make that voice credible when you are the only one? Okay, as you said, we are <laughs> prepared for the discussion. Well, to me, and in fact, I'm going through an onboarding right now for yeah. my new board role. And it really starts by being aware of what you know, what you don't know, right? It, it's really about knowing your capacity, uh, what you can voice with confidence, what you cannot voice with confidence. I mean, I find it easy to say, this is an area I don't know much about, but I'm gonna ask a question which can provoke interesting discussion. So it's first, I would say awareness. Second, preparedness, right? How well do you prepare for meeting people in informal settings as well? I mean, if possible, face-to-face, I mean, how do you have um, the basis of trust, as you said? I mean, trust in any organization is one of the biggest costs, right? I mean, when people don't trust each other, it, it costs the company a lot, time, or energy, many things. So uh, preparing well, knowing your strengths and weaknesses, and I'm really trying to be a little bit bold about making the first step. And it does help if you are given a mentor. I don't know if Hagen's here. I mean, uh, Hagen asked me if I could like, um, you know, uh, for example, uh, support someone uh, in a, let's say new role or a new situation. This is important. I think we need to give people the feeling that they have people to rely on. They have people to mm -hmm. go and ask questions about. So uh, I'll, I'll say that. I think it's personal effort as well as support network. And, and one of our colleagues in that conversation we had last week um, had said she comes armed with data. And exactly. Takes, takes the emotion out of it and just puts the data in front um, of the group. I, I, I always just think this is such a, you know, as a person who used to do risk uh, management back in the early days of, of what I would call the modern era of risk management, it was presumed often that if the risk manager wanted to talk to you, they were coming with bad news. And so, as you had just said, when you walk in, there's a defensive nature to that conversation. So part of what I always tried to do was to have conversations with all of these people about baseball, about you know, the weather, about their family, so that when we talked to each other about something that was related to the work they were doing, that's not the only time they saw me. And so we built this trust in boardrooms. And I'd be curious to, to get your take on this. <clears throat> you don't see each other very often. And when you do see each other, you each have a very limited window in which to speak. So would you have guidance? Let's say, let's say there's some people on the, on the, in the meeting with us here who are chairs of their board. Yeah. What guidance could you give to someone as the chair so that a new voice on the board or someone who might be a lone voice on the board feels, I don't wanna say safe because you know, it's not necessarily gonna be a safe environment. It's a, it's a I'm facing challenges, but how do they feel comfortable um, speaking up? What, what kind of advice might you give? Well, I guess this is, uh, you know, that I'm not a, a marketer by, you know, originally, but I know there's something like your unique selling point or you, your unique contribution. Like I would ask, definitely have a one-to-one -one with each board member and ask, 
what is the unique thing that you'd like to bring to the sport? I mean, is it more on the operational side, on the strategic side or this? And then after understanding that person's kind of uh, both passion and uh, competency, that area that that person, and of course, contributions can come outside of that area. But once I understand what uh, that person wants to bring, I would always welcome you know, what do you think about that? What do you uh, want to offer on this? So the chair has to be inviting. The chair has to make sure that different voices are heard. I mean, that's a key role of the chair. So so it's establishing that trust that your voice is valued. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Because I again, in a very small group like the board, um, you have the ability for groupthink to take over very easily. Even if you have a diverse group of people in the room, groupthink can still take over yeah. because you have that commonality of all being a same a part of the same board. Yeah. And when there is groupthink, it becomes much harder to challenge. Yeah. So if you do have a chair that's inviting and making sure that alternative alternate voices or alternate ideas are heard, um, maybe that helps break that. I mean, it seems like a good approach. Exactly. Now I'm looking at Shala or yeah, Tamara. I think we are we getting close to when I I, I can see many questions are coming. Should we, <laughs> David? Is that okay for you? We start inviting some questions, maybe. I mean, I I, we, I could go on forever. Uh, Yashim and I can talk for a long time. Yes, we have that <laughs> practice. <so. laughs> but uh, let's start and hear some questions. Maybe I I now see Hagen, but yeah. of course, Tamara, back to you. Uh, sure. So uh, we got a question from Chala, which was, do you think risk should be governed and managed at managerial levels only or at all levels of the organization? And if it's the latter, how should boards, C-level and directors encourage the team to embrace risk? Yashim, do you want to start? Because I have an answer to that that I would rather not just front run you on. Okay. Well, uh... I, of course, I, I, I'd say at all levels, but it, it does, uh, you know, the board and the management have different, of course, horizons and perspectives. The board would like to work, uh, uh, should work on the governance and the management, of course, on the enterprise risk management. Uh, so the fundamentals of the operational risks. So the, the time horizons are different. The uh, way uh, it is executional or more governance is different. But I, I would say uh, to the question at all levels, but it requires a build up and it requires a coming from the top, setting the tone, setting the culture, uh, I would say. And, and Chala, I think it's a great question in part because the typical model is from the top, right? And that's not to be a critique of that at all, you seem, but to say that you had mentioned the book I wrote um, called Governance Reimagined, which goes back now, yeah. I think 2012 is when it was published. Yeah. But it actually argues for what's called a networked and distributive form of governance, mm -hmm. which the part that comes from the top, so to Yashim's point, is philosophy, values, and boundaries. So those are established at every level of the organization. Here's what we're trying to achieve. Here are the rules for achieving those. Don't go outside of those rules. But as long as you're inside the rules, do whatever you think is best. So you talked about this customer listening team. What a great risk management tool. That's pushing risk management, which is the risk that you lose the capital that your customers bring to you, closest to the source of risk as you can. And I advocate strongly for that to say, and the further you can push risk management to the source of the risk, the better that risk management is going to be. The more it's owned by the people who are responsible for interacting with all of these capital providers, the better it's going to be. And then you have an infrastructure in place that makes sure it's paying attention to that, that it's yeah. staying within those boundaries, that it's actually focused on the goals that the board has set. So you have both this top down and bottom up. And, and that distributive um, a network form of governance is based on work other people have done. Um, it's not anything I created. I just brought together some, some governance models. And then um, this idea of, and this will sound maybe a little too abstract for this conversation, but if anyone is familiar with the term commons or common pool resources, 
we're used to talking about something called the tragedy of the commons, which is when no one really owns anything individually, but everybody has access to it. The story is that people tend to abuse it. They tend to take more than their share and they tend to abuse it. But actually there's Nobel prize winning work on how to successfully govern commons. And by doing so through empowerment and rules and enforcement mechanisms, it's, it's, you know, it's all well laid out and it's demonstrated to work better than hierarchical command and control models. And when we start to think about in our organization what commons we have to govern, we have brand, we have capital, we have trust. All of those things are commons, meaning everybody in the company has access to those. So how do we build the rules around making sure that we all sustain and enhance those? And, and to me, this word governance is about how an organization lives. It's not the legal rules, it's how it lives. Yeah. So this is imparting a freedom to live within certain boundaries. So that's, that's the, why I love your question because it is both, but if you haven't done the empowerment part and you haven't communicated well what the top down part is, uh, it, that won't work. I see a hand, maybe tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> oh good, somebody likes Ostrom, I like that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Hagen is, uh, has his hand up. So if you want to uh, add anything or ask a question, feel free. Thank you, Tamara. Well, David, thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, I, I'm a headhunter for boards and, and I advise boards about composition and effectiveness. And I wonder whether you could comment briefly on, on the one hand, diversity being a strong driver against groupthink people with different backgrounds looking at the same thing from a different point of view. At the same time, the climate in the boardroom, often very much shaped by the chairperson, mm -hmm. all these different people around the table can actually voice their concerns. Can you just maybe have an example of, of good and bad or maybe yeah. briefly comment on that? Yeah, and, and so I always use this expression when people talk about moving into management roles, and I think still the board role is not exactly management, but it's it's it got um, parallels to it. Management's great, except for the people. And that's because working with people is difficult. We have to understand each other in order to work effectively with each other. So one example I'll give you of, I think, of, of how boards become more attuned to working well, particularly in the environment we're in now. And Hagen, you may have seen this before, but we work with a company um, out of London. It's a team of psychologists mm. and they developed something called Risk Compass. Mm. And what Risk Compass does is it looks at the five scientifically valid personality types that are out there. It's not um, Myers-Briggs. It's These are actual personality types that have been validated through research. And they ask a whole series of questions to map out an individual's attitude towards risk. And they put it on this compass and, and it's, you know, it's along these lines of emotion and reason and all of that. One of the things that I love in what they do is it gives you an understanding of who you are. So that makes you one of the boardroom and understanding yourself better. But one of the more powerful tools they have is to put the entire board together in an analysis to show where the center of gravity is at the board, where it is that there's a dominating trend in the boardroom, who it is that has those dominating personalities, so that the conversation is, how do I communicate with you better, knowing where you are? And is our board aligned with what we say our risk attitude is? So this sounds maybe a little bit too academic, but the truth is those misalignments are where we get problems in surprise outcomes. Those misalignments or lack of knowledge about the risk attitudes individuals have are places where we get conflict in the board. And the thing that we know is that when there's pressure, so whether it's financial pressure or external pressures, people revert to type. And so if you don't understand that, if you don't understand the person across from you as a risk loving person, and that your deeply, your, your deep uh, approach to risk is to be controlled, the two of you are gonna have a conflict in those situations. So uh, one of the things I would love to hear from you, Hugan, is do you know of any boards 
who are assessing the risk attitude before they recruit someone onto the board? I wish I knew. And no, I mean, that's, see, that's an issue, right? We would hope that that's, you probably put together a skills matrix and you probably put together gaps that they're trying to address. And some of those are forward looking gaps. Very few boards have any idea about whether they have gaps in their risk attitude. And sometimes it could be they don't have enough risk takers. So I think it's, to me, it's one of those things, the psychology of risk, to me, it's an emotion. No. We don't know the future. So we make an emotional assessment about the future. That's how our brains work on this. So I think understanding that psychology of risk is um, critical. So the, the examples I would give you are, the, are that an organization who goes through this understands each other better. And when they go to recruit a new board member, they have the opportunity to try and fill in a gap and, and not overweight things. And, and, you know, it's again, it's not very commonly used, but it's, it's an incredible tool. And David, just a follow up question, yeah. building up on that. <clears throat> so here in the in the room, we have um, a couple of very experienced board members and some of the people in the room are aspiring board directors. But nevertheless, <clears throat> what can they do to find out more about their own risk profile, risk emotions, etc? What is a good way to discover that? You know, I, 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 it's not our product. It's, it's so I, I feel, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm pushing something too hard. It's a group in London that, that I've just, I've gone through the assessment. I love the assessment. Um, so, you know, that assessment, I believe, takes about 20 minutes. And I, I, I don't remember, maybe a couple hundred dollars. It's not very expensive. It will give you more insight about your attitude towards risk than anything you think about yourself. You could write down what you think your attitude is towards risk. This is going to tell you more about it. And Yashim, we were talking a little bit about chairs of boards. Yeah. There is a, so this, this compass, um, I think there are eight different or maybe nine different sections, eight around it, one in the center. And they, in their, in their testing, people fall in those groups roughly evenly. So, you know, roughly 12% of people fall in each of the groups. In the center are people who have aspects of every single person around them in their attitude towards risk. And those make great board chairs. So to your point, Yashim, where the board member is making sure the voices are heard, the board chair is not saying, I'm a risk lover. They don't say that out loud, but in their attitudes. So I don't wanna hear from this person on the other side of the room who I know is afraid of everything. Um, so that's, I would recommend that because there's not, I don't know of a better way of understanding your attitude towards risk unless you have to make a really big trade in a really fast market, and then you'll understand something about yourself. Thank you. Can I just add a quick story? I mean, uh, I was addressing a risk uh, that a kind of uncertainty in one of the committees and then the board, and then the chairperson. I guess I repeated it a couple of times, and he didn't like the uh, you know the focus on it, and he said. Hmm. We're going to do what everybody else does. I mean, so he was just trying to get out of like, what do we do about it? So people can have sometimes, you know, that, uh, you know, negative attitude. So anyway, we had a conversation and we brought it back, but it can be something that people don't want to hear or just avoid. So, yeah. And in a crisis, nobody wants to stand out because if you stand out, you're the one people notice. Um, and if you're looking for someone to blame or you're looking for some place, but you you are drawn to the person who's making themselves noticed. Yeah, the next question is maybe uh, a nice one to to uh, tag onto that. Um, it's a question that asks, should it be a requirement to have a, a risk professional as a member of the board? Would that help to well, boards to, to understand and approach risk better. And maybe, um, as you say, David, it, it nobody wants to stand out, but if it's your task mm -hmm. to, um, to, to keep an eye on the risk, then um, it's okay to stand out. Yashim, why don't you talk about sort of that transition again from before you went through some of the risk education, and then I can circle back and add on to that. Sure. I mean, de definitely uh, expertise on risk is uh, a really good place to start because first it really gives you the 
tools, the credibility, the, the knowledge base that you can start um, providing actually the input. Um, all my career, I had been exposed to uh, various, you know, uh, risk work at the management level. And then as I start transitioning into the boards, I started becoming part of these committees, as I said, risk detection, risk committees. But again, my vocabulary was limited. So as I took the courses that David is mentioning, I really started to see it not only as a course thought from knowledge transfer as a knowledge transfer course but really with live examples that was really the nice thing about the courses with that it was bringing expertise case studies the ways things can go wrong so it was really being exposed to collective knowledge and i'll bring that back to the networking it's really important that for people to open uh, their eyes into what risk is i mean it's really not about loss or you know something to run away from it's something it's about uncertainty and it can go either the negative way or the positive way and it's about you understanding how to use it strategically into the value creation so indeed yes i have uh, equipped myself more on the risk side and now i think i i'm able to provide more value beyond the let me say traditional definition of a risk professional and, and getting back to that qualified risk director that I'd mentioned, I think when we first wrote those guidelines, it was either 2016 or 2013. And two things that this is written by about 25 different uh, chief risk officers board members. So it was, again, one of these collaborative projects. A couple things that were very strongly um, described in this. One of them was a qualified risk director is not simply a former chief risk officer who wants to serve on a board. So we wanted to make sure people understood we're not trying to say, put a risk manager on your board. And the other side of this was to say, you have to have almost equal, if not more importantly, a breadth and depth of business experience in order to become a qualified risk director. So we evaluate people across four different categories acumen of business and that's you know business pnl responsibility years of experience seniority risk acumen so do you have an understanding of risk in the context that we're talking about have you ever responsibility for a risk portfolio leadership what do other people say about you have you been invited to do things that are leadership focused education what is your background what have you done to further yourself in terms of your education you can't become a qualified risk director and by the way yashim is one you can't become a qualified risk director without having strength in all four of those areas. So that's how we tried to say bringing this risk knowledge to the board is not just a graduation program or an elevation program for chief risk officers. And the other thing related to this sticking out or having your head sticking up above others, we also made it very clear in there that there has to be a safe harbor for someone who has this qualified risk director designation. No one person, can insulate an organization against things going wrong. So you can't use this designation as a reason to blame that one person. It's a safe harbor if they've done their work. Same thing, we sort of have this business judgment rule around things that can go wrong. We need to have that same safe harbor of people who've been given that kind of recognition for their understanding of risk in the context of business. Um, so I would say that in our programs, 80% or more, or more, I'm probably actually underestimating it, are people who come to us with that deep business experience and that deep leadership experience and great education, they don't have the risk piece. And so we try to help them fill in uh, that part so they have that well-rounded ability to bring risk into the strategic board discussions. And some of those people are former risk managers, but, but most of them come from a business background. Um, Yishim, David, thank you so much. Uh, I see that we're now running out of time. Also, thanks a lot to Jessica and Tamara for their chat moderation. And it was a really fruitful conversation. Uh, we loved everyone's inputs. We are going to be forwarding the questions in chat to you, David and Yishim, in case you'd like to take a look, in case you'd like to answer. And we also have a very short poll 
uh, to make our events better. So we would really appreciate if you answered these questions that uh, have appeared on your screen now. And thanks again. Really, really great, insightful discussion. Thank, thank you. And Chala, please let anyone know. Um, I know Yashim feels the same way. Uh, reach out to us anytime. It's, I truly yeah. love these conversations and I'm always happy to talk about any individual situation. So don't, don't hesitate to reach out. Exactly. And I have seen, I have saved the chat and I see there are some questions. Maybe we can come back to the people who have asked the questions and to the group if necessary, because there are some questions on the risk compass, etc. So I'd be happy to do that. Anyway, I'm part of the EWAP community, so happy to uh, come back. All right. So thank you.